Now, our next speaker is Asad Kah. He is the Chief Technology Evangelist of WSO2. He will talk about a new agile methodology and architecture today. Welcome, Asad Kah. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me yeah, clearly? I hear yeah, I can hear you clearly. Uh, can you share mm -hmm. your screen? Yes, I'm sharing the screen. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, I can see, see your slide. Okay, here's okay. your time. Perfect. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to my session. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from uh, uh, different places joining for this session. Uh, so I'm Asan Kabe Singh and I'll give you a quick introduction about myself uh, and then I'll jump into this topic. So I'm planning to spend the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes on this topic and um, have a productive discussion with you about how you can use programmability uh, to achieve true agility. Uh, so I born in Sri Lanka. Uh, so if you are not aware about Sri Lanka, it's a small island uh, in the Indian Ocean. And I studied in Ireland and now I am living in California. Uh, so I play basketball and uh, these are my heroes. I'm an avid fan of uh, Lakers who's in the NBA finals this year. And I uh, used to live next to the um, uh, Levi Stadium which play uh, American football and I'm an avid fan of uh, 49ers. Uh, even there have a lot of things happen uh, for Linkin Park as a, a group. I st more than 80% of my audio library is uh, packed with Linkin Park uh, uh, audios. And this is my family, and this is the new addition to my family. Uh, so uh, this is my personal profile, and I'll give a quick introduction about my professional profile as well. I started my career as a Kabul programmer, uh, programming uh, on mainframes, and then moved towards more architecture-related uh, activities and became an architect and uh, started a startup uh, um, working on some hedge fund related tools and then uh, because of my um, uh, eager to work on open source technologies I joined WSO2 into 2008 and uh, went through various roles uh, and responsibilities uh, at WSO2. Now I am telling the WSO2 story as well as in general API and integration story uh, to the community as the chief technology evangelist. So that is who I am. So the jump into the topic. Um, so agility is heavily used today and everybody wants to become agile. Uh, but uh, if you look at these statistics, uh, even uh, most of the organizations are moving towards agility. It's less uh, number of people benefiting the true benefits of agility. And interestingly, it is 4%. So uh, there's an issue uh, with uh, uh, the the approach, but the uh, and the results that they are uh, achieving. Uh, so let's look at what, why, and um, why why this uh, less number, um, and uh, what are the uh, reasons for that. So the main, uh, the first reason is about the environment. So I took this example, like if you run a Formula One in a not structured road, you will not get the full uh, value or the full efficiency of the vehicle. So to have the full efficiency, you need to run the, uh, uh, the car uh, in a proper track. So that is similar to the environment that we work, even the uh, teams work on agile principles and then practice agile uh, uh, practices. They will not gain the uh, true benefit if they are not working in a a clear environment that support agility. The next thing is about people itself because um, they have to follow the agile principles and then they have to uh, the, uh, operate in a true agile manner uh, to achieve the overall agility. So each and every person in agile team got a responsibility and they have to deliver uh, those responsibilities on time with quality to meet the end uh, goal. So this pit stop in F1 um, is a really good example that once 
the car stopping at the pit stop everybody has to do their job on time for the driver to take the car back to the track and then achieve their end goal so similar to that the entire agile team has to be um, uh, very efficient and then timely deliver their uh, core responsibilities so when it comes to development um, the agility is linked with the developer flow how smoothly that they can uh, do their day-to-day -day work without having any uh, any hurdles so it, it's not only the individual um, flow it's about the team flow everybody has to be aligned and then uh, work on that so i call it as more frictionless um, flow uh, that way people are really getting productive inside these teams so the main issue with this uh, uh, the, uh, the productivity is uh, the interruption that uh, these uh, developers and uh, the technical teams are getting due to many meetings and other discussions. I think that is one good thing uh, with pandemic, uh, since everybody is working remote, uh, there's less meetings. And even if you have uh, online meetings, they finish on time and people have a lot of time to be productive. So one reason uh, that we realized while working with many organizations, even people try to uh, follow agile principles, the internal structure of the organization doesn't support it. So it's basically um, the people try to move out from this waterfall method for a long time using different uh, methodologies like uh, Spring and then uh, the Agile related uh, different uh, methodologies. The internal architecture is still layered. So what will happen, uh, the layers are creating gates and gates are slowing down the flow of uh, the information as well as uh, it slow down a thing uh, required to be done by a specific uh, person. As an example, now if an application developer wants to create a database schema, they have to talk to the data team and then depend on the, uh, uh, the availability and then how busy they are, the, uh, the, the, that particular task will carry out based on the uh, workload that they follow. So it slowed down the, uh, uh, the, uh, the productivity of that particular application developer that they had to wait. And if you compute this uh, wait time versus productive time in an organization like this, the wait time is really high uh, than the productivity. And that's where I like the concepts like uh, the um, shadow IT came into the picture a couple of, uh, I mean, a decade back uh, because people try to avoid central IT or uh, these kind of layers and uh, try to do uh, the task that they require to uh, finish their job by uh, within that particular team. So even people uh, are trying to be agile, uh, but they are not clearly agile in a situation like this. And we call it as fast waterfall or agile for um, the reference as a code name. And this is an interesting tweet that we identified uh, with uh, the centralized uh, architectures, uh, people creating center of excellence group. Again, it is creating another silo because uh, the center of excellence teams are creating more and more blocker for agile teams to operate independently. So a very interesting code. And then the complex processors, like, so this is one drawback uh, we have with service-oriented architecture that created a lot of uh, complexity and the governance. And then this govern, uh, this, uh, the complex processors are interrupting the flow of the, uh, the, the developers as well. And then the wrong technology stack, uh, uh, interrupting the flow as well because if the things are too complicated, people can't uh, be productive and be agile. As well. So those are the fundamental reasons that why organizations are not um, uh, not true agile. So the agile manifesto is a really good um, uh, place to refer and then look for uh, more and more uh, concepts as well as practices. And that is kind of the Bible for uh, most of the concepts that we are discussing here.
Then we are coming to the next part of the topic. Uh, it's about the programmability. So let's take a look at what it is first, and then we can link these two concepts uh, after that. So it, it started with uh, uh, way back on uh, how you can uh, program different kind of devices and then provide more and more capabilities or functionalities for the end users to use this type of uh, devices and it, it started with uh, uh, devices as I mentioned and uh, it went through different kind of uh, stages like standard logic devices and then uh, we got already programmed uh, log logic devices and then um, it released the programmable logic devices as well and they followed different type of standards to implement these uh, devices and the history started with the transistors and then we are uh, in the era of uh, like chips and microchips that you can program and embedded these uh, uh, chips into various devices and it it, star, it can vary from a car or a vehicle to a, uh, a refrigerator to a washing machine any device that we use uh, uh, in uh, today's day-to-day uh, -day life uh, can be beneficial from these uh, uh, devices and in networking uh, we heavily use the programmability like uh, programmable switches programmable routers uh, we call it as manage uh, switches and manage routers were very uh, popular and it started with the layer two layer three and layer four seven different type of capabilities um, uh, so it used heavily uh, in networking as well and uh, keep on getting increased uh, the capabilities and providing a lot of flexibility for us to manage uh, this data movement in networking and then the, the, the programmability heavily influenced the infrastructure layer as well. Uh, started with uh, uh, the uh, hosted services like the low level infrastructure, uh, creating uh, environments uh, provided by an API, started with the uh, cloud infrastructures as well as private cloud uh, infrastructures, uh, started using this stuff as an example. Kubernetes is a really good example. And then the uh, the infrastructure as a code, like different type of scripting languages like Chef, Puppet, um, Ansible, those things got popular as well, like how you can easily connect to these infrastructure level uh, programmable interfaces and uh, uh, deploy your uh, different uh, applications as well as create environments, databases, um, message brokers, uh, so and so forth. Uh, the, the application architecture uh, linked to these things as well. So we need to take a look at that. Uh, traditionally, the uh, the uh, we use the layered architecture that all the capabilities are stacked in different type of layers. This is what we used for a, a long time. And then uh, this is uh, one layered architecture diagram that I introduced in 2011. Uh, a, uh, multi-dimensional layered architecture with the application lifecycle, quality of services, and bringing into the picture with the traditional system of systems or traditional uh, layered functionality. And we are moving towards uh, the uh, distributed architecture, even the present uh, earlier uh, from Kong, uh, Marco explained about a uh, lot of uh, distributed architecture principles, including service meshes, microservices, micro gateways, uh, like that. So we are in an era that uh, all the uh, components are running individually and uh, moving towards more of a distributed architecture. And if you are uh, more interested about this topic, um, you can, um, I can share a link that you can take a look. Um, so uh, I have authored three architecture papers in these topics that you can get more and more information. So API is uh, playing a huge role in this uh, architecture patterns if you jump into uh, the uh, the those architectures again and uh, look at how these things are connected we will get a clear idea i will go into that in the next slide so apis are not new uh, we were using apis for a long long time and it went through an evolution like from pure technical apis to semi-technical apis into managed apis and uh, api products 
as well. So if you look at the API, the layered architecture and APIs, each and every layer connected with APIs, and I categorize these APIs into edge APIs, domain APIs, and utility APIs. So it is similar in the uh, distributed architecture as well. Uh, these different kind of distributed components expose their capabilities using APIs and APIs everywhere in a distributed architecture. So as I mentioned, this is a URL that if you want to read more about these three architecture patterns and how the API uh, helping, uh, you can uh, touch this URL and go and read uh, these detailed architecture papers. So the programmability connects with the pipelines as well, uh, so that we build pipelines and then run a different type of automate different type of processes um, uh, in uh, different uh, pipelines that we generated and pipelines. Um, uh, the APIs are the foundation for this that you can use different APIs uh, uh, exposed by different uh, uh, application uh, programs and uh, you can uh, link them to pipelines. Then the programmability uh, uh, through the APIs increase the automation because now you can link uh, any component that you have in your architecture into these pipelines and make them um, uh, automated. Then how you implement it, implement this stuff is what I'm planning to uh, discuss. So for that, even I have authored this methodology document that you can refer in detail, but I will walk you through quickly on how uh, you can address that. It's, it's more about the culture, architecture, people, process technology, and how you can get the digital alignment. And to start that process, you can refer this, uh, uh, the uh, maturity model, and then see where you are in this uh, story of APIs and then programmability and identify uh, your position and uh, move towards the right of this equation. So the, uh, as I said, the, the idea here, refer the uh, methodology and then uh, try to move to the right. And uh, once we do that, uh, we will achieve a lot of uh, uh, advantages. And to achieve that, uh, you can have the pipelines, as I explained earlier, and then test-driven development, cloud-native support. Uh, then you can utilize open source, as well as the decentralized architecture that I explained earlier. And end of the day, you can build a cellular enterprise. Again, I'm not going in detail about this. This is about how you can take the decentralization into organization principles and address that. Again, I have written a detailed article that you can refer this uh, URL and go and uh, look at it in detail. So once you do this, uh, implement the programmability, uh, there might be a question how you um, how you measure the success. So again, my proposal is to use a bunch of standard methods. The flow efficiency is a really good way that you identify that the wait time and the productive time and um, measure the efficiency. And then another set of tools are like mean time to repair, mean time to repo, uh, mean time to um, uh, detect MTTD and MTTTR. Uh, those are really good measurements to show that uh, uh, the your success to the business uh, by measuring uh, these things properly. So, so if you take it as a summary, like everybody is a journey towards agility and agility is a fundamental thing. And um, you need to give, a, give more autonomy to different organizations and uh, the API is uh, playing a huge role in this uh, equation by uh, making uh, the foundation for programmability that you can link uh, any component that you run uh, into your pipelines. And it increases the speed, it increases the repeatability once you uh, make uh, something programmable, it is a repeatable process. And then uh, you have more flexibility, speed, repeatability, flexibility, create a lot of room for you for innovation as well. So that is the end result that uh, you will identify. So that is uh, uh, what I thought uh, discuss with you and then give you some data points to go in detail uh, and uh, get more details from the references that I created. And if you are interested, uh, you can connect me uh, from Twitter. I have put my Twitter handler on LinkedIn, um, as well as uh, you can email me on this email address uh, that I provided. So it looks like I have around one minute left. And if there are any questions, uh, I think I can uh, take those questions uh, and answer them.
Thank you, uh, Asaka. Asaka. Um, we will jump to the uh, Q&A section. Uh, Asaka, can you uh, stop the broadcasting your screen? Yep, sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, from your, from my point of view, uh, most of the company or enterprise are still uh, in the monolithic or uh, fast waterfall stage. Can you give us some advice how to move forward to the continue our drive goal? Yeah, so I think it, it's, a, it's a journey. I would say it's a journey like you can't expect uh, to uh, uh, change overnight. Uh, so that's where the maturity model will be really helpful. Identify where you are and then have a proper uh, plan like step by step how you can move to the right of the uh, the maturity model and then again the key thing here uh, we have to business as usual while we are doing this change because it should not affect the core business uh, so uh, i think uh, uh, that's a vital part of that as well as we need to look at multiple things people aspect like we can't uh, uh, like we, we should not look at the way that um, get rid of the current workforce and get the complete new set of people it's not about that how you can engage them how you can we can empower them and with the current workforce how we can move in this journey is a key thing so uh, personally i am involved heavily in um, as a consultant on this uh, uh, kind of journeys as well so if somebody is interested you can contact me and i can happy to give some advice and data points uh, on that particular journey 